afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is truly a pleasure to be standing here at the third conference. Earlier this year, I honestly didn't think uh, I would be standing here or we would be having a conference. So firstly, I'd like to thank Simeon for having the vision to create this, this type of forum in Serbia. Um, it's, it's great. Also, probably more importantly, uh, the patience to, to deal with us as an industry. Uh, we do have our ups and downs, but thank you, Simeon. Um, I'm actually going to continue some of the themes that, that have been touched on and, and talked about this morning, rather than necessarily uh, going into detail on, on the work we've been doing in Serbia for the last year. Uh, as a starting point, I think it, it, everyone needs to understand that it doesn't matter whether you're a junior exploration company, uh, an intermediate mid-tier producer, an explorer or a major, we all react to market forces in the same way. Okay, so that nobody is immune to, to the effect of market, the market. So on the way over here this week, I was reading, uh, there was a, a supplement in the Financial Times on Tuesday about Serbia. Now it was, it was only four pages, but it was, it, there were some good articles there. And it was talking about the potential of Serbia. It probably mentioned every possible industry except mining. Okay, so that's, that's the problem we're facing, and this is why we have, you know, such a forum, because um, it's, it's very much, very much overlooked. In fact, if you Google uh, Serbia GDP for, for 2012, it's a long time before, before you even find a mention of mining in, in those statistics. So that's what we're all here to do, um, is to, to make a significant contribution to the GDP of, of of Serbia and obviously that, that is the, the benefits to um, the people that live here and, and um, you know, the Republic as a whole. So if I just get that, I probably will be saying some forward looking statements. But what, what I was going to do, um, this study was commissioned by the World Gold Council. Um, they asked PwC to do it. Uh, it only came out last month uh, and it's only specifically on gold, but I thought because it's the first time someone's actually made a conscious effort to dig through all the data globally, um, that I'd share with you some of the, the findings of that study because they are, they are quite interesting. Um, but when you see gold up there, you can apply that to any metal, okay? It's just that gold was the, the, the reason for commissioning this study. So just looking at, at gold from a, from a global supply, perspective. There's the graph. Um, you know, last year there was about four and a half thousand tonnes. Two thirds of that comes from mining. So that's two thirds every year. That amount of gold is dug out of the ground and, and becomes part of the supply chain, if you like. I mean, gold is a little bit different and we'll touch on, on demand in a few slides time. Um, but, but also importantly, there are a third a third of the uh, supplies is the recycled gold, and, and you've probably all seen it. I saw a few walking around Belgrade, the Otkup Zlato, you know, and how they've popped up in the last, you know, three years, certainly since, since the financial crisis, and very much as a response to the increase in gold price, um, you know, since um, 2008. Okay, so the top producers. So the mines... So, so what the study actually does is, is they break down the stats and they said, look, let's just look at the top 15 gold producing countries because um, statistically they're responsible for almost 80% of, of world production. So there's the six largest producing countries and, and out of those six, they've produced half or you know, more, slightly more than half of all the gold that's coming into, into the system. So China, Australia, the United States, Russia, Peru and South Africa. So that, that, that table, I mean, it does change, uh, change, the order changes around from time to time and it certainly has in the last 10 years and, and China um, going to number one is, is a, a fairly new uh, situation but it's, it's unlikely to change. So what the study actually um, looked at was taking all of that that gold production from the, those 15 countries and, and calculate, calculating out a, a gross uh, value added, the, the, the GVA uh, amount. It's just a, it's all the methodologies in the report, it is available on, online. 
But what they're saying is that um, about $80 billion uh, of value was created by extracting that gold from the ground. Okay, so to put that into perspective, um, because you know, 80 billion is a big number, what does it actually mean? Well, it's equivalent to the uh, entire national economic output of Ecuador or Azerbaijan, um, or 30 percent of one city in China. Closer to home, though, that's twice the the annual GDP of Serbia. Okay, so this is just gold. So. I'd, I'd like you to think about metal, all metals, lead, zinc, everything else that comes out of the ground, and obviously you'll get much, much higher numbers. Um, this, this graph actually I thought was um, one of the more interesting ones in, in, the, in the study. Um, there's the rest of the countries uh, that make up the, um, uh, the top 15. Uh, so what have we got there? Canada, Mexico, Indonesia, Ghana, Uzbekistan. Who knew Uzbekistan was in there? Uh, Brazil, Papua New Guinea, Argentina and Tanzania. Um, uh, what, what it's showing, the red bars are essentially the value of that gold produced and, and the little yellow diamonds are uh, the, uh, the that, that value of material as a percent of GDP. Okay, so with China it's um, a huge economy uh, but it's also the largest gold producer on the planet. However, the effect of that gold mining is 0.2% of China's GDP. So it really, really is a very, very, it just goes to, again, to show how, how large an economy and how much of an effect China's gonna have on, on um, the world economy going forward. Now, if you look at the next few, um, you know, Australia and, and United States, um, you can see the reason for that is quite, quite simple. They're, they're mature economies. It's, they don't just rely on mining. There's, there's lots of other, inputs into the GDP, even though they are quite large producers of, of this metal, it doesn't drive the economy, okay? However, look at Peru. Now, 10 to 15 years ago, that yellow dot probably would have been up here somewhere, okay? So just in the last 10 to 15 years, the impact of, of gold mining on the economy has come down because the, the overall economy has grown. and, and to be honest, in Peru's case, a lot of that will be other metal mining, other, other metals other than gold. However, it's, um, you know, it's, it's important to, to note, come down here, let's, let's say Ghana, okay? Um, very significant contributor to, to the Ghanaian economy, uh, and thankfully from multiple mines, okay? That's also important, because if you look at Uzbekistan, that's essentially one mine. Okay, driving, driving those metrics. Now, that is something governments need to consider in the mining business. They need to be prepared for huge success. Okay, what happens if another uh, bore Maiden peck field was found in Serbia? Okay, and it was, and it was um, not a state company, it was a private company. That would have a huge impact on the economy of, of Serbia. So, you know, you've probably seen, I mean, there are issues. If, if you've got one mine or, or, or two very large ones having a significant impact on your GDP, it needs to be carefully managed and governments need to, to plan for that success now. And, and you could look at Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan for some of the more recent issues on, on having, relying or over-relying perhaps on, on mining um, uh, in, your, in your GDP. Um, and again, the other one, Papua New Guinea, again, huge, huge um, uh, inputs to the, to the GDP there. Uh, again, thankfully, from, from multiple mines. And Tanzania is another good one. Lots of gold mines. Um, uh, but again, significant, significant um, proportion of the, the, the output, the GDP output. So what have we got now? The advantages of gold mining. Okay, so obviously... And, and this report only focuses on direct impacts, okay? No indirect impacts. So it's only directly related to producing that gold. So there you go. Out of all of those 15 countries, you've got over half a million employees directly related to producing that gold, which is a fairly sizey number. Um, you looked at, there is that note there that artisanal mining has not been included. Artisanal mining is what happens in the jungles or the Amazon jungles in Peru or um, West Africa or lots of parts of Africa. It's, it's non-regulated mining, okay? But 
some of the, the, the estimates uh, from, it's very labour intensive obviously, but um, some of the estimates suggest some five million um, people are employed in, in artisanal mining and, and up to a third of, of uh, annual gold production is coming from those sources. Obviously it's not, it's, there's no official data for that. Okay, but, you know, getting, getting back to our, our gold producing countries from, from the study, you know, a significant amount of exports and therefore foreign exchange earnings, this is another, this is a key, uh, comes from in particular gold mining. And you can see there, 36% of all Tanzanian merchandise exports, 26% from Ghana and Papua New Guinea, 21% of Peruvian exports. Now, imagine if the National Bank of Serbia could turn around and say, we're getting 26% of our, our national exports coming from metal export. They'd be over the moon. They'd be ecstatic. So we also have, you know, apart from the normal taxes that, that, that all corporations uh, are exposed to, um, you know, uh, corporate and, and, and labour related, the mining industry does have some specific taxes. Um, and these are just summarised. These are the, 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 the most general ones. There's the mining royalty, the licence fees, and obviously the export duties. But the study has estimated what all of those top 15 countries are paying in royalties to their respective governments, okay, on top of the corporate tax, on top of all the labour-related taxes, and it's, it's a very large number. It's some, some $4 billion. And essentially that number is... Um, uh, is your rental fee for, for using the deposit, okay? That's, that's the way I always look at it anyway. So where does all the, the, the you know, gold go, so to speak? Um, you know, global gold demand's been increasing uh, since, since before the, the financial crisis in 2008, peaking in 2011. Um, but really, the, the, the four key elements um, for, for gold demand are the central banks, Okay, I think, I think that's been in the newspapers enough over the last few years that, that central banks, it's been a long time since central banks have sold a significant volume of their gold holdings. Um, you've got 35% in investment demand and far and away that's bars and coins. That's physical gold, okay, that's physical metal. Um, jewellery at 43% and if you take countries like India, that jewellery is effectively acting like a bar or a coin. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a store of wealth. And then really it's only 10% uh, is, is used in, in um, manufacturing or technology. So you could, you could almost say, well, maybe not 90, but let's say 70-odd 70, 70 percent of all gold is used for investment purposes, okay, or, or wealth preservation or storage of wealth, however you'd like to view it. Um, now, out of all of that demand, uh, the two, and, and it's by a long, long way, the two key consumers of, of this metal, this product, are India and China. And interestingly enough, both of those countries at the moment are prepared to pay a premium to own physical gold. Okay, India pays a bit more than, than China, but they're, they're prepared to pay more than what the, the gold price is quoted on uh, if you go to Bloomberg or, or some financial site. So you've got to ask yourself, what do they know that we don't know? Um, it's worth, worth thinking about it. But I'm not here to promote gold. I'm only here to, to talk about the benefits of gold to, or mining, metal mining, okay, not only gold. So, uh, you know, how do I pull this back and, and make it relevant to everyone sitting here? And, and you know, how do, we, how do we improve, you know, Serbia's capacity to, to benefit from mining? Uh, or any other, yeah, any other metal mining. Um, it's pretty simple, okay? These, these are the sort of things that we need uh, to convince our shareholders uh, to continue to, to support and finance our activities in Serbia, okay? So we need security of tenure. Um, that came up quite a few times this morning. And, and it's, it really is just a simple one. I, I don't understand why an investor should be penalised for spending money exploring or developing every year, um, employing lots of people, um, what's the matter with that? If you you know why if you're doing it and you're and you're fulfilling 
your promises, your, your, your pledge to the ministry that we're going to spend this much, why can't you keep on doing that? I, I don't understand how that's in any, not in everyone's best interest. Um, that first point there, you know, the transition from, from exploration to mining, uh, that, that's something we feel probably needs a bit more attention in, in the next public discussion. Um, transparent system for understanding where all the ground is, we've got that already. Um, you know, the guarantee that if you actually find something, it's not going to be taken away from you and put to international tender or, or whatever sort of tender process. We don't have that, that's great. Um, clearly defined and stable fiscal regime. You know, we, it's, it's good. I mean, there's always room for improvement. Um, you know, over time, um, uh, these, uh, these systems uh, do become more efficient. Uh, we, we've got most of that here. You know, there's pretty clear on, on what our obligations are tax-wise and um, depreciation and everything else. So, I mean, that's, that's a big tick. I mean, like I say, I'm not criticising here. Most of this is already in place in Serbia. This is good. You know, this is why we're all standing here today. Pro-business political system, um, you know, I, I certainly see, you see it. I mean, this, this is happening and has been happening for the last, um, you know, at least 10 years um, easily. It, it, everything is improving. So this is what we need. Um, you know, this is what we require from our, our partner, okay, which is the, the Serbian government, who represent the interests of the people of Serbia, to develop and, and find mining projects. Now, why, why is it that simple? It really is because the gold's already in the ground, okay? The metal, if it's lead, it's already there, okay? The, we don't require a government committee to be formed to decide where the gold should be placed into the ground of, of Serbia. It's already there, okay? All we need to do is find the metal, that's the exploration business, and then develop and extract that metal at a profit. That's the mining business. So the point for putting up this slide is uh, all we're asking for is improvements in the ease of doing business within Serbia. Okay, that, that's how I summarise this. The gold's already here. I mean, the evidence for that is that, that there is so much interest for exploring in Serbia because the metal's already here, we just need to find it and we just need to, to develop it. So just quickly on Avala, um, this is our latest resource statement. This was the result of, of all the drilling last year. We have spent a significant amount of time on refining and understanding the metallurgical characteristics of this ore body because it is something new. Okay? It's something new for Serbia. It's, it's, it's something new for a lot of people. Nobody's ever built a mine around this, this type of material. Uh, it's taken us a long time. To, to work out how to extract this, this metal, this gold, profitably. Um, but we're almost there. The challenges we faced, it's, it's very, very fine grained and it has very, very slow um, flotation kinetics, okay? But, but very shortly we feel that we'll be in a position to, um, uh, to let everyone know officially uh, via, via the press release mechanism um, that we will be able to, to extract gold from these projects with, with a very simple flotation um, situation, which is, which is most of the mining here in Serbia anyway. Okay, so nothing new, nothing unusual, stock standard flotation. Uh, you get a gold rich concentrate and that gets sold and feeds back into what we were talking about before, the supply and demand um, uh, you know, system for, for gold. So with that in mind, we've, we've recommenced um, in Canadian terms, it's known as the preliminary economic assessment. Um, in Serbia, that would be called an elaborate. So we've started that again, okay? We've started that process now um, because we, we believe we've just about got the metallurgy fixed, sorted. So come uh, the first half of next year, we would expect to uh, be submitting an elaborate for the Timok Gold Project uh, to the Ministry, and we'll be happy to defend it. So that's Avala uh, down at um, Dunav. Okay, we, we've been drilling this year. We've been drilling around the Kisiljak deposit, which is a copper gold porphyry. Uh, we've, we've now finished that drilling. We will be updating 
uh, resource estimates uh, over, over the coming months, and then we'll look at doing something similar, um, which is working out how is this project going to, to work, um, what, what are the economics, and, and we need to be able to support our position to, to go into an elaborate. Um, just before I leave you, I just want to, it's another, another plug for, for doing business in Serbia. Um, just 20 kilometres away from, from Kisiljak, we uh, applied for a, uh, an exploration licence um, early last year, had it granted um, in, in fairly short order. The licence is Degerman. Um, you know, we've, within 18 months, and certainly before we're doing a little bit more drilling now, um, and we'll be finished by Christmas, but essentially what I'm trying to say, in, in under two years, we were able to identify somewhere we thought had potential. We went and applied for that ground. The ministry very timely granted that licence. We started to do the basic work. Um, we put in trenches and then we started drilling. Uh, it's all Serbia Shube land, but everyone, everything's worked great. You try and do that in under two years in another country in the Balkans and you would probably still be waiting for your permits to get trenching. So it's a, it's a huge competitive advantage for Serbia that you can physically do this, this business with, with very, very few roadblocks. It's, it's, it's great. Um, so really, that's, um, that's all I had to say today. I mean, I, I certainly support what, what the panel was saying this morning. Um, you know, we, we've made some pretty good progress on, on which way the laws are going to go. Uh, but really, the time cycles are long. And, uh, and like I said, it doesn't matter what your market cap is or if you're a junior or a major, we all react in the same way to the market forces, OK? So it's never a straight line to develop a project. It takes time. Thank you. <clears throat>